uh, who's going to speak to, I believe, sort of on his new book, Yeah, we the Canadian. Um, he was actually born in Vancouver, uh, played hockey for the BC Junior League. Uh, until recently, he was based in Montreal. Um, some of the things that might have sort of been formative experiences or sort of came to notice was that he was actually the vice president of the Concordia Student Union, um, but he was uh, expelled in 2002, uh, partially for his role uh, in a protest against the Israeli Prime Minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, um, but also for also organizing against the free trade for the Americas. Um, and I guess sort of one of the things that he's sort of been dominant on, and I'm interested to hear more about, is sort of a critique of Canadian foreign policy, in particular actually the Haitian coup. Uh, he's actually written seven books, uh, ranging from sort of a book on Lester Pearson and peacekeeping, uh, to from rink rats to student activism, and also, you know, recently as well, Canada and Israel building apartheid. Uh, so, it'd be great to talk to you. Welcome. So my first question, how much of capital did you, capital did you actually get through? <laughs> First chapter. <laughs> so, uh, thanks to the Critical Social Research Collaborative for putting this on, and thanks to everyone for coming out. Uh, I just finished a uh, 40, 40 event tour for my latest book, The Ugly Canadian, Stephen Harper's Foreign Policy, and so that's what I plan to, to speak about uh, today. Uh, <clears throat> And I'm sure that some of you saw that uh, uh, two months ago, Stephen Harper won a World Statesman of the Year Award, <laughs> which was given out by a pro-Israel, pro-American empire group in New York, and given to him by none other than Henry Kissinger, uh, who Harper said he admired Henry Kissinger's foreign policy, uh, Kissinger being one of the preeminent war criminals of the latter half of the uh, uh, 1900s. And so, a few of us uh, here, here in Ottawa at the uh, Communications Energy Paperworkers Union office decided to give, in response to this, decided to give Harper an alternative prize to the uh, World State of the Year Award, which we dubbed the Richard Nixon Prize <laughs> for Harper's principled, forthright, and steadfast international policies in the interests of the rich and powerful, regardless of the consequences for everyone else. And I did um, <clears throat> my best uh, Clint, Clint Eastwood impersonation at the union office. I had an empty chair where there's a little <laughs> picture of Stephen Harper on the chair. And I explained why the R Richard Nixon Prize Granting Committee had given Harper this award. Uh, so we were impressed by his position on Afghanistan. When uh, most Canadians want those troops brought home, <clears throat> Harper has maintained a thousand Canadian troops in Afghanistan, including the Joint Task Force Two Special Commandos involved in nighttime assassination raids. Uh, so uh, that we were impressed by that, and also his policy when parliamentarians are asking uncomfortable questions about Afghan <coughs> detainees. Harper had the good sense to shut down the thing uh, called Parliament. More obscure elements of his foreign policy that we looked at was his policy uh, on Haiti after the terrible earthquake there when countries around the world were sending their heavy urban search and rescue teams to try to get people from out under the rubble. Harper decided instead to send 2,000 Canadian soldiers to, uh, to defend the interests of Haiti's 1%. So the Richard Nixon Prize uh, Granting Committee was impressed by that policy. Most of all, we were impressed by his policy on the environment. And uh, at international climate negotiation meetings, Harper has made the tough decision to support more carbon in our atmosphere than, just, than rather than just go along with the international consensus. So we applauded him uh, for, for his policy on the environment. Unfortunately, Stephen was not able to make it to our event, uh, but his people told, told me that they'll be there uh, and make it next year, so we've already decided to give him the second ever uh, Richard Nixon Prize. Uh, <clears throat> so it certainly, I think it's important to make fun of an organization that would possibly give Stephen Harper a World Statesman of the Year Award. But in, but in all seriousness, I think that uh, too often Canadians underestimate how uh, destructive Canadian foreign policy can be for people elsewhere. And the consequences of, that of Canadian foreign policy are real for millions of people around the world. 
And I don't, I don't criticize Harper's foreign policy for being a mistake or for uh, weakening Canadian influence in the world. That's the type of criticism you tend to hear from the opposition parties, if any criticism. Uh, but rather that these policies are fundamentally immoral and should be seen, in fact, as tantamount to crimes against humanity. And one of those policies that's immoral is the low-level war against Iran that Canada is waging. It doesn't get referred to as a low-level war in most of the dominant media, but that's what it is. The, the, uh, uh, the economic sanctions that Canada has against Iran, the point of those economic san sanctions is to make the Iranian economy, the Iranian economy scream. And what that means uh, for, for people who are uh, at the margins of Iranian society, that, that means people who are having difficulty getting milk and eggs, having that much more difficulty getting those foodstuffs. And there's a number of reports coming out about the human toll of the, uh, of the uh, uh, sanctions campaign against Iran. You have Canadian naval vessels patrolling off the coast of Iran, running provocative maneuvers alongside US Armada, trying to elicit a flashpoint, some sort of conflict that could justify something bigger. You have Canadian troops occupying a country bordering Iran, Afghanistan. Uh, we know there are joint task force two Canadian special commandos in Afghanistan. I wouldn't exclude the possibility that those troops are involved in cross-border incursions into Iran. I have no proof of that. Uh, everything JTF2 does is secretive, so we will never have proof of it. But certainly there's uh, substantial allegations that American and Israeli operatives are involved in cross-border incursions into Iran. So I wouldn't exclude the possibility that, that Canadian uh, JTF2 commandos are also involved. Uh, you have Defense Minister McKay in March talking about the, how the Defense Department is planning for a full-scale war uh, on Iran, just sort of musing about that publicly. And of course, about two months ago, the Conservatives uh, cut off diplomatic relations with Iran, expelled Iranian diplomats from this country, uh, shut down the Canadian Embassy in Tehran. That is often the step before a full-scale declaration of war. And this campaign against Iran is all under the guise that Iran is possibly building nuclear weapons which the best American Israeli intelligence suggests that in fact they've made, they haven't, back in 2003, they made a political decision not to uh, uh, pursue nuclear weapons. But, but, but the Harper government has been, has opposed Arab League calls for a nuclear-free Middle East. Why would they oppose calls for a nuclear-free Middle East while making such a big thing about Iran's nuclear weapons? Exactly. So Israel doesn't have a possible nuclear weapons program, but it has between 100 and 300 uh, nuclear weapons today. So, so they oppose calls for a nuclear free Middle East. They have, the conservative government has abstained on a number of international atomic energy agency resolutions calling for uh, Israel to bring its uh, nuclear program under IAEA controls. Uh, so they got no problem with Israel's nuclear weapons. Likewise, they have little problem with the Washington's 5,000 nuclear weapons. U.S. spends $60 billion a year on its nuclear weapons program, four times Iran's entire military budget. So the, the hypocrisy and the double standards of the conservatives on this issue are just, just off the charts. Um, and this campaign against Iran is is already having an effect on millions of Iranians' lives, and hopefully that won't be that won't get worse. But but there's still a possibility um, that they, that will develop into a, a, a more a thorough, full-scale attack against Iran, which would have a huge consequences on, on millions of Iranians and um, the broader region. The Harper government has further militarized Canadian foreign policy increasing the military budget from about 15 billion to about 23 billion, increasing the size of the Canadian military, uh, specifically or especially the special forces, JTF2 and others, which have uh, doubled in size. And a big part of the motivation for focus for building up the JTF2 and other special forces is that they operate in secrecy or in the 
military's lexicon, deniability. So you can deploy them anywhere, and we never know about it, which obviously uh, facilitates, politically facilitates uh, deploying JTF2. And there's, there's one book from a former JTF2 officer uh, who discusses being deployed to Colombia to fight the FARC, discusses being deployed to the Congo, uh, involved in an incredibly uh, a violent affair in the Congo, uh, all kinds of things that would be that m very far from what we would assume JTF2 uh, or you know what, what the public would kind of hear about in terms of what Canadian military is doing. Uh, the Harbour government has been is setting up permanent Canadian military bases in, in, in uh, seven countries around the world. That came out in uh, mid-2011. Uh, they already have a base set up in Jamaica, Kuwait, Germany, plans for bases in Senegal, <coughs> Tanzania, South Korea, and a couple of other possibilities. And that's to be ready to engage in future wars. So a little bit, bases a little bit all over the world to be prepared for future wars. The, an element of this, this further militarization of Canadian foreign policy is domestic, uh, in terms of convincing the Canadian public to support uh, their wars. And they spend huge amounts of money on that. Uh, uh, 400, the latest, uh, the 2000, in 2010, 2011, it was $353 million spent uh, promoting the military uh, or trying to convince us to, to support their wars. That's now the mo most recent budget that's gone up to just under $400 million. Uh, devoted 661 full-time staff members to promoting the military. So this incredible campaign of trying to convince the Canadian public to support uh, war, and uh, there's all that, you know you see that play out at all kinds of levels at NHL games, uh, maybe not right now, but uh, CFL games, uh, uh, all kinds of different you know cultural arenas. Uh, in 2011, the Conservatives uh, changed or rewrote the citizenship handbook that's given to new citizens, where they included more than a dozen references to Canadian military history. The previous handbook had none. And that's just to sort of try to indoctrinate new Canadians into this growing military uh, uh, ethos. And I, I, I list out a whole bunch of different examples of this in the book. The, this growing militarism of Canadian political culture kind of hit a, uh, what I consider a bit of a climax in July when the head of the military, Walter Natizek, told the Canadian press, quote, we have some men and women who have had two three, and four tours. And what they're telling me is, sir, we've got that bumper sticker. Can we go somewhere else now? Right? So for the military, bombing a country, occupying a country, is a bumper sticker. And here you have the head of the military calling for another war, just for the sake of it. And what was the response from the NDP foreign affairs critic? I didn't. What was the response from dominant media commentators? Basically nothing. And I think that reflects the further militarization of Canadian political culture, where uh, Nat and Zink would feel comfortable making uh, uh, such a statement. So there's, there's certainly a, 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 a preparing for ongoing future wars. One element of conservative foreign policy that needs to be criticized is the Israel no matter what policy which has many different uh, components to it. Uh, just, I don't know if people saw the front page of the Globe Mail yesterday uh, about how the, the threats that Harper himself was making to uh, Abbas uh, a couple months ago about Palestinian statehood bid. Uh, it's pretty intense, uh, direct threats of a whole series of different, uh, kicking out the, the, the uh, Palestinians for embassy diplomatic mission is here in Ottawa, uh, cutting off Canadian aid to Palestinian authorities, very clear direct threats that was, uh, that apparently Harper made a couple months ago. So there's, there's you know, innumerable elements to this, this uh, pro-Israel policy. There's a deepening of ties between the Canadian military and the Israeli military, including at the corporate level, the military companies uh, that's facilitated with public money in large part. There's a Canada's building up a Palestinian security force to, to, uh, to basically support Abbas uh, in his struggle with, with Hamas and also basically to, 
to uh, advance the uh, Israeli occupation in the West Bank. Um, so there's all kinds of different facets. There's a, obviously the UN votes about uh, a week ago. Prensa Latina had an article about how Canada had uh, 100, between, on different resolutions on Palestinian rights, anywhere between 161 and 166 countries that voted in favor of these resolutions with six countries opposing. Uh, Israel, the US, Canada, Micronesia, Palo, and one of those other um, small states that's about to disappear because of global warming. Um, so the, 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 they've been supporting them diplomatically and, and at so many different levels. Um, one element of this pro-Israel policy that hasn't received that much attention that, that, that should is the Conservatives have made it openly acceptable for registered Canadian charities to support settler organizations in the West Bank. Uh, settlements which, con which contravene international law, which even the Canadian government ostensibly considers contrary to international law. And registered, registered Canadian charities can support settlement organizations and continue to provide tax write-offs. So a state subsidy, depending on your tax bracket, bracket if you donate to this group through uh, a group, you get as much as 40% of the, the money um, as, a, as a subsidy. And so this is what one of the organizations in the book that I quote uh, says on the website, Christians, Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, which is a registered name charity. It says, it quote, provides Christians with deeper insight into the significance of Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria is the, is the West Bank. Uh, that's the, what right wing or religious Israelis refer to with the, the, the West Bank. What it refers to is, quote, the heartland of Israel and the people who live there. This is done by bringing groups of Christians to visit the communities and providing information about the communities on an ongoing basis and provide financial and moral support to the Jewish communities who are developing the land in faithfulness to their God. So here you got a registered Canadian charity openly talking about how it's providing financial support to settlements, settler organizations, and it continues to provide tax write-offs. Likewise, if you pick up the Canadian Jewish News, you can read about charities that support the Israeli army Registered, likewise, registered Canadian charities. So it's, 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 uh, you get a state subsidy for supporting the settlements of the IDF. On the other hand, when it comes to Palestinian charities, uh, if you, if a Canadian group that, that supports a Palestinian charity, either directly or indirectly associated with a whole slew of Palestinian political actors, that's actually illegal. So it's illegal for a Canadian group <coughs> to, to support a Palestinian group that's either directly or indirectly tied to the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, Hamas, and four or five other uh, Palestinian groups that are defined as terrorist organizations in this country. That's been mostly a theoretical thing until about a year, just over a year ago, the Canada Revenue Agency, uh, at the behest of the Conservative government, cut off the charitable status of a Toronto-based group called Urfan, a largely Muslim charity, uh, because they were supporting orphans in Gaza, supporting hundreds of orphans in Gaza, and specifically, they had delivered a dialysis machine to a hospital in Gaza. The hospital in Gaza was uh, uh, overseen by the health ministry, as hospitals sometimes are, <laughs> and the health ministry uh, was controlled by Hamas, since Hamas won elections uh, a few years ago and, and took over control of, of Gaza. So they had their charitable status cut off because of sending this dialysis machine. And board members of Urfan still have hanging over their heads the possibility that they, were actually, they will actually be pursued criminally for supporting orphans and a hospital in Gaza. So this is a really serious double standard between you can get a tax write-off, a state subsidy for supporting the uh, settlements, the IDF, uh, but uh, you'll get your charitable status cut off or you'll never get charitable status if you're trying to get it. Uh, as an organization, if you're supporting orphans or hospital in Gaza, and you might even find yourself um, uh, sitting in a Canadian jail. So this pro-Israel policy is, is, uh, is disturbing and troubling. Uh, <clears throat> elsewhere in the region, in response to the pro-democracy movements, uh, the Arab Spring pro-democracy movements, the Conservatives are really offside with those movements. The Harper, uh, supported Mubarak's 30-year dictatorship in Egypt until the final hours. Three hours before Mubarak uh, 
announced public announces resignation publicly. Harper made a speech essentially endorsing Mubarak's transition plan. They supported Ben Ali in Tunisia until after Ben Ali has, was, uh, was uh, overthrown. Uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, the conservatives have deepened Canadian ties to Saudi Arabia, uh, one of the most repressive regimes in the world, incredibly repressive domestically, the monarchy there, uh, also a huge funder of some of the most reactionary forces throughout the Arab world, the Saudi monarchy, and the conservatives have deepened ties there. There's been about uh, six or seven conservative ministers that have visited Saudi Arabia in recent years, signing a whole number of different accords. Uh, in 2011, the conservatives okayed $4 billion in weapon sales to, Sa to Saudi Arabia. $4 billion, second biggest recipient of Canadian weapons after the U.S. And they continue to okay these weapon sales even after Saudi forces entered Bahrain to prop up the 217-year monarchy in Bahrain that was uh, uh, facing widespread pro-democracy demonstrations. And uh, it was actually the Saudi forces entered Bahrain with uh, Canadian-built uh, light armored vehicles produced in London, Ontario. And the Conservatives continued to okay further deliveries of light armored vehicles even after the uh, Saudi invasion of Bahrain. In 2010, the Conservatives began having uh, Saudi fighter pilots come train in, uh, in uh, Cold Lake, Alberta, and uh, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. So deepening ties to the Saudi monarchy. Apologists for Israel suggest that the, uh, one of the reasons why the conservatives are so pro-Israel is it's supposed to be the only democracy in the Middle East, right? Which, uh, when you see the conservative position on Mubarak in Egypt or on Ben Ali in Tunisia or, or the Saudi monarchy, suggests that democracy is not necessarily their primary concern. Uh, closer to home, there's other examples of that. So in June of 2009, the Honduran military overthrew Manuel Zelaya, the elected uh, president in, in uh, Honduras. And Canada was the only major aid, aid donor to Honduras that didn't cut off any of its aid after the coup. So the European Union, the World Bank, even Washington suspended some of the aid they had been delivering, uh, were planning to deliver to, to, uh, to Honduras. The conservatives refused to cut off any Canadian aid even though Honduras was the major recipient, the leading recipient of Canadian aid in Central America, about 17 million bucks a year. And uh, the, the, they also refused to stop the military training assistance program, whereby Honduran troops were trained in Canada, not a lot of them, but still a certain number, and uh, very s highly symbolic to, to not cut off ties to a military that had just overthrown an elected government. More recently in June, in Paraguay, Fernando Lugo, a priest that had ended 61 years of one party rule, was, was overthrown. Uh, the Canadian government was the only government in the hemisphere to immediately recognize the new government in Paraguay. And uh, <clears throat> just by chance, there were Canadian corporate interests lurking in the background in explaining the conservative's position in Paraguay with uh, Rio Tinto Alcan, Montreal-based uh, company, that had been negotiating uh, for a number of years a plan for subsidized energy to uh, set up a um, aluminum, uh, uh, aluminum processing plant, a multi-billion dollar uh, um, project. And uh, the, the, the Lugo government was sort of ambivalent about the, the subsidized energy to the, to the Canadian company, to Rio Tinto Alcan. And within a week of the coup, the new government had restarted negotiations with Rio Tinto Alcan. Likewise, in the case of Honduras, Canadian, there were Canadian corporate interests lurking in the background of the Conservatives' policy in support, or tacit endorsement, if you like, of the coup in, in Honduras. You have uh, Guild and Activewear, which is a Montreal-based uh, t-shirt maker, one of the biggest blank t-shirt makers in the world. They uh, were not happy with the Zelaya government for having increased the minimum wage. Uh, uh, they have about 12,000 employees, I believe, in, in Honduras. Likewise, uh, Canadian mining interests were not happy with uh, Zelaya for having uh, brought in a moratorium on new mining concessions. And in fact, Wright, Wright's action found out that Goldcore, 
which is a Vancouver-based, second biggest gold company in the world, they were actually found to be paying and uh, busing people in the community where they operated to the capital, Tegucigalpa, to demonstrate in support of the coup. Uh, so it's a pretty active Canadian example of Canadian corporate interests uh, um, uh, backing the coup. And, and since the coup in Honduras, the Canadian government has been all over rewriting uh, Honduras' mining code in a way to better service, uh, better serve uh, foreign mining interests. And uh, this, there's a document that Mining Watch uncovered from a foreign affairs document uh, on, on their thinking, the double speak of, uh, of uh, foreign affairs' perspective on Honduras' mining before the coup and since the coup. And it says, quote, <clears throat> Honduras is in the process of transformation from the anti-mining Zelay administration to the pro-sustainable mining and pro-corporate social responsibility global government. Right? So the elected government is anti-mining. The, the government that comes to power in highly dubious circumstances is pro-sustainable, pro-corporate social responsibility. Uh, so that's a pretty uh, uh, impressive uh, doublespeak. And uh, since the coup, they brought uh, Honduran officials to Toronto, to the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada meeting. Uh, try to uh, influence the new mining legislation. There have been a number of meetings that Canadian diplomats in Honduras have had uh, on, on the issue of uh, the mining code in Honduras. And that gets to a, an important part of understanding the more rightward shift in Canadian foreign policy, which is the incredible rise of Canadian mining investment uh, <coughs> abroad, which <clears throat> has gone from about $30 billion of Canadian mining investment abroad in, in 2002 to $210 billion today. This is just a phenomenal rise. In the case of Africa, about $250 million Canadian mining investment in, in 1989, about $29 billion today. It's about a 115-fold increase in, uh, in 20 uh, so years. And uh, Basically, these Canadian mining companies' investments abroad are heavily, they, they, they've benefited from all those structural adjustment programs that the International Monetary Fund has pushed uh, throughout Africa and Latin America in the 1980s and 1990s, opening up those countries' resor natural resource sector to, to foreign investments, uh, privatizing state-owned mine companies, uh, you know, lowering uh, tariffs, sort of lowering royalties uh, on resources. And, those, and Canadian mining profits are heavily dependent upon uh, not going back in the other direction. And one of the first things that movements challenging neoliberal capitalism do, social movements or governments usually, is to increase natural resource uh, royalty rates, uh, sometimes to nationalize nationalized mines. So all that is incredibly threatening to Canadian mining profits abroad. And I think so that's one of the explanations for Ottawa being more aggressive abroad in recent years is understanding just how much uh, any attempt to challenge neoliberal capitalism will have on, on uh, corporate Canada's profits. And alongside the rise of Canadian mining investment abroad has been innumerable social conflicts at Canadian operated mines. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard some of the stories, the horror stories of people being killed by mining security forces, uh, communities, uh, water streams being uh, poisoned by mining uh, you know, runoff from the mines, different toxins. Uh, pretty much at this point, <coughs> you can pick any country in the global south and you find an example of a Canadian-run mine that has led to social conflict, ecological literally, almost any country in the whole global zone. And the Conservatives don't have any problem with this, <coughs> it appears. They, they, uh, they've uh, they, uh, voted against Bill C-300, which would have ended public support for mining companies uh, found to be engaged in abuses abroad. Harper himself has uh, lobbied on behalf of controversial Canadian mining projects when he was in Chile uh, a few years ago. 
not long before he was there, there was a couple thousand people demonstrating against a, a planned Barrett Gold uh, project in Chile. Harper made sure to go to Barrett Gold's office, went in Chile and said Barrett Gold follows Canadian standards of corporate social responsibility. When in Tanzania, uh, not long after Barrett had fired uh, hundreds of striking miners, another Barrett operation in Tanzania, there's been dozens of people killed in recent years. Harper made sure to laud Barrett Gold when in Tanzania. In the case of Mongolia, the Conservative government actually established Canadian diplomatic relations, according to the business press, uh, to lobby for Canadian mining interests in that country. Uh, initially a trade commission and a full embassy in Mongolia uh, uh, to, to lobby for Canadian mining interests, particularly Ivanhoe, uh, which, which was a very controversial project in Mongolia, a multi-billion dollar project, which the Ivanhoe project uh, um, was, uh, was considered the main election issue in the 2008 election in Mongolia. So setting up the diplomatic relations to lobby for mining companies. In the case of the Congo, when the Congolese government rescinded First Quantum, Vancouver-based company's concession in the east of the, uh, the Congo in uh, late 2009, the Conservative government tried to block Congolese debt forgiveness at the Paris Club of Debtor Nations. This was debt forgiveness that all the other members of the Paris Club of Debtor Nations had agreed to. This was debt forgiveness, this was the debt was uh, was mostly accrued during the Mobutu dictatorship. This is odious debt that the majority of uh, impoverished Congolese should not have to uh, repay. And yet the Conservatives used the Congo's debt forgiveness as a way to put pressure on the government to, to uh, negotiate with, uh, with First Quantum. Ultimately, they were only able to stall the debt forgiveness, um, but they, uh, they uh, still uh, used it. And they did so even though First Quantum acquired their concessions in the Congo in very dubious circumstances. So uh, there's a UN report from 2002 that discusses how uh, First Quantum had actually paid bribes and kickbacks to government officials to get their concession. Uh, but that doesn't bother the Conservatives who support any Canadian mining investment abroad, no matter what social conflict, no matter what uh, uh, they're engaged with. And in recent uh, months, the question of um, one of the things the, the Conservatives have done is really deepen the ties between CETA, the aid agency, and the mining sector. And it's been somewhat controversial in recent months. Again, I think the front page of the Globe Mail on Monday or Tuesday this week had a whole article about, or maybe it was last, last, last Friday, about uh, the new CETA minister and, and his speech um, about how the plans to deepen the ties uh, between CETA and the mining sector. And, and one of the elements that's been particularly controversial in that is, is uh, the role CETA has played in bringing uh, NGOs like Plan Canada, like World Vision, together with uh, mining companies like I Am Gold or Barrick Gold in, in uh, uh, places like Peru and Burkina Faso. And basically what's going on is the, how these, this, this, this new model seems to work is that the NGO will put up a few hundred thousand, two or three hundred thousand dollars, the mining company will put up three or four hundred thousand dollars, and CETA will put up a million or two million bucks for a project that the, the NGO administers in the community where the mining company is operating in Peru, Burkina Faso. And so what this does is it provides incredible financial inducement to the NGO to work with the mining company because there's so much public money that's being made available if you're willing to work with the mining company. And basically the intent of the projects is to pacify local opposition to the mine because these are very controversial mines and, um, and so you, get, you, you bring the NGO into very active participant in this uh, pacification uh, program. And to get a sense of the thinking at CETA or within the Conservative uh, government on uh, the role of CETA and the mining sector, uh, in a speech in February to the Prospectors Developers Association of Canada meeting, Bev Oda, after finishing her uh, $16 glass of orange juice, <laughs> she told the mining, mining executives, quote, I look forward to learning from your industry on how to improve the effectiveness of Canada's, Canada's development work internationally. 
and to working more closely together to create a better life for those living in poverty. Uh, because you know that the, the mining companies, they, 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 their objective has nothing to do with profits for investors. It's all to do with how do we get poor people out of poverty, right? Um, and basically what Oda is saying is there's no difference between what CETA does and what the mining companies do. We're all just trying to get uh, the poor uh, out of poverty. And <clears throat> when referring to Harper's crimes against humanity, there is no bigger crime than their opposition, their undermining, their sabotaging of international accords, international climate negotiation meetings. Uh, uh, in attempts to reduce modestly uh, how much uh, greenhouse gases are emitted into the world. And they've been repeatedly, five years running, the Conservatives have won the, the um, the uh, colossal fossil given out by uh, dozens of hundreds of environmental groups to the country that does the most to undermine um, different uh, climate negotiation meetings. And the obviously they pull out the Kyoto Protocol. And they're doing all of this in the context of the Climate Vulnerability Monitor as well as a whole slew of different scientific studies showing in the kind of climate vulnerability monitor that already 400,000 people are dying because of climate disturbances every year around the world. And that's not Canadians, obviously, uh, mostly. Uh, that's all, mostly people, the most uh, vulnerable people in some of the most impoverished parts of the world, people in Bangladesh, uh, Ethiopia, places that actually emit very little <coughs> in terms of uh, carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And Harper clearly doesn't care about the consequences of, of his policy on this front. And their position on the international climate negotiation meetings has received a certain amount of attention. There has been a, a, you know, discussion of this. What's received less attention is the conservatives' opposition to all attempts, or to, to attempts, should I say, in the US and Europe to reduce the amount of carbon emissions from fuel sources. So when California passed the low carbon fuel standard, uh, Canadian officials immediately started lobbying against California's low carbon fuel standard. And specifically to exclude uh, or to not have California uh, uh, identify tar sands oil as being a heavy emitting fuel source, which it of course is, uh, but they don't want California to identify it as such because that could potentially impact uh, tar sands exports. Uh, and when Wisconsin legislators discussed the low carbon fuel standard, Canadian officials were there in Wisconsin to tell legislators that if you pass this low carbon fuel standard, you will be dependent upon Hugo Chavez uh, for your oil, as terrible as that might be. And uh, so they've been lobbying aggressively uh, against the low carbon fuel standard in the US and they've worked with, with uh, domestic American oil companies to uh, have, them push, have them push back against any, any legislation that might impact uh, tar sands oil in the US. Likewise in Europe, they've been lobbying ferociously against the fuel quality directive that the European Union has been discussing. And uh, between mid 2009 and mid 2011, there was 110 lobbying visits by Canadian diplomats in Europe uh, uh, against the fuel quality directive, or specifically to, ex to exclude tar sands oil from the fuel quality directive. And the intensity of the campaign prompted a Finnish member of the European Union Parliament to say, quote, there have been massive lobbying campaigns by the car industry, by the chemicals industry, banks, food giants, etc. But so far, but so far, I have not seen such a lobbying campaign by any state in reference to Canadian lobbying in Europe against the fuel quality directive. And <clears throat> to get a sense, and likewise, we have the access to information documents showing how the Canadian embassy in Paris has been working with Total, the oil company uh, in, in London with Shell and in Norway with Statoil, to have them lobby their, their government against uh, 
uh, the fuel quality director. And the intensity of the campaign uh, in, in the US, uh, according to Embassy Magazine, it, it's the energy file is uh, the biggest file that the Canadian diplomatic apparatus in the US, the, the, the embassy and the 22 Canadian consulates in the US uh, deal with. So most of what they're dealing with is pushing back against environmentalist efforts to reduce uh, the flow of tar sands oil to the US. And, and to get a get sense of the, the scope of the campaign, when the <clears throat> New York Times ran an editorial criticizing the Keystone Pipeline, which would bring Alberta oil to the Gulf Coast, the head of Canada's consulate in New York wrote a letter criticizing the New York Times' position. So most Canadians, well, we, when we think of the consulate, what we think of is, is that if you go travel, uh, you get into trouble, you lose your passport, the consulate's there to help you out. In fact, it appears most of what the consulate's doing is lobbying for dirty Canadian oil interests in the U.S. in the context of innumerable studies showing the incredible and growing toll that runaway global warming will have on, uh, on, on humanity and particularly uh, people in the, in the, in the global, global south. So this has to be understood as, as a crime against humanity, this, this, this policy. Uh, getting towards a conclusion, the question becomes, what do we do? And as I said elsewhere in other talks, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> Obviously, uh, <coughs> defeating, defeating Harper in 2015, uh, doing what can be done to stop or stall the, their agenda over the next few years has to be part of it. Uh, there's all kinds of elements to what needs to be done uh, at the domestic level in terms of domestic issues, and I don't go into any detail on that. But I think it, we, the one element, a very fairly easy contribution to that in terms of general, not just about foreign policy issues, but just, just domestic stuff that, that should be done. It's, it's amazing how often conservative ministers speak publicly, and we find out about the meetings beforehand, and there's no one there to ask a tough question, heckle, or do something more exciting than that. Uh, and there should be. You know, if it's a one person or it's 100 people, uh, um, we should have and I've suggested that we should have a network of people across the country that, uh, you know, even if you find out about a meeting two or three hours before, you have people in every single community across the country um, that, you know, just willing to respond uh, ASAP whenever conservative ministers speak. Because the point of those announcements is to get some positive attention. And, you know, disrupting one of them has very little consequence in terms of uh, negating that positive attention. But if you can start actually disrupting a certain number of them, that can actually start having a, a consequence. And it also will affect how they, they'll do less of them, which would be bad, you know, they make their strategy uh, um, more difficult. And anyway, so that's one of the things I think that we, we, need, we should do. It's not that, it shouldn't be that difficult to, to coordinate. <coughs> but on terms, in terms of foreign policy, uh, which is what this book's about, of course, uh, the, I think that a big part of what we need to do is we need to force um, or so, sorry, should I say, we, we need to uh, uh, build a cross-issue foreign policy network uh, of the different groups that are already challenging certain elements of conservative foreign policy. There's, there's Latin American <coughs> solidarity groups, pro-Palestinian groups, there's, there's uh, uh, mining justice organizations, uh, <coughs> anti-war groups, environmental groups that are all taking on some element of conservative foreign policy but too often don't see any commonality of struggle and are often not even necessarily that much uh, in solidarity with the other groups. Ob obviously, that's lots of people in those groups are, and some of those groups are, um, see a, you know, the bigger picture, but often uh, they don't, or too often they don't. And so bringing together some of those groups and, and uh, to cre create a cross-issue foreign policy network, and that's definitely one of my hopes politically with this book and, and these talks, and it's also a hope uh, with those stickers, the, the, the 300,000 those stickers printed of Stop Harper's Crimes that have uh, a, a point on militarism, mining, Palestine, 
and uh, climate, and then a website, harperscrimes.ca, with a top 10 list of Harper's Crimes Against Humanity. And the point there is to get people thinking, I mean, one is to sort of just you know, tarnish Harper's brand uh, in terms of you know, foreign policy, but it's also to get people thinking kind of cross-issue and say, you know, there's what's climate and Palestine have to do with each other. On the surface of it, nothing, but in fact, um, so getting, getting people to sort of see the cross-issue nature and to, to challenge the, the, the foreign policy kind of in a more holistic way. And if there's traction for a cross-issue foreign policy network, one of the things, and, and actually in terms of the stickers, John Baird's writing is somewhere not far behind this here. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know where I am exactly, West. but somewhere just past, West just west of here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so one of the things that I have you know, um, would like to do is, is really uh, uh, target that writing. So anyone who does live in that writing, uh, take, take extra extra number of stickers to put up um, around there. Um, but so if there's traction for a cross-issue foreign policy network, I think one of the things we might want to do is have a, a, a popular tribunal or a people's commission that uh, takes on, uh, or that, sorry, that, uh, that uh, uh, hears testimony about uh, Harper's crimes against humanity with high-profile judges like uh, uh, Maude Barlow, or David Suzuki, and Naomi Klein. And, uh, and if there's traction for, from there, uh, and obviously that would be a very media mediatized uh, event. Um, so there's traction from there. I think one of the things we we want to do is is run negative campaigns in some conservative writings where conservative MPs won by sm by small numbers of votes, uh, where we target the foreign policy issues. So, for instance, put up a couple thousand posters uh, just before the election, reminding all the constituents of the conservative policy on climate issues, right? Force that issue, force that issue in onto the political agenda in the lead up to the election. And uh, very aggressively, not none of this passive stuff that uh, I think too often uh, political activists um, uh, partake in, but very aggressive, like you, you, they're gonna see, there's gonna be a poster on every single poll, every single piece of public space in that writing. And, I have some, uh, some personal uh, experience with this type of campaign. So in the 2006 election, Haiti Action Montreal and uh, some groups from the Haitian community, we, we organized uh, a campaign against Pierre Pettigrew, who was then the foreign minister, uh, who was heavily responsible for Canada's policy in Haiti, destructive policy in Haiti. And during the six weeks election, we put up 2,000 posters in Pettigrew's writing with his picture on it, saying wanted, for crimes against humanity in Haiti. We handed out 15,000 leaflets, and during the six weeks, we got more media attention about Canada's destructive role in Haiti than we had gotten in more than a year of quite active uh, uh, activism. And, uh, and uh, so we considered our campaign, uh, even if Pedro would have won, we would have considered our campaign a success, just because we got so much uh, media attention. We had you know, rallies in his writing, press releases, press conferences, et cetera. Um, and so we would have considered our campaign a success uh, just from the media attention. He lost. Both La Presse and Le Devoir newspapers said, said one of the reasons why he lost was this campaign that we had waged. I think there's, there's lots of elements of this campaign that cannot be replicated elsewhere. There are lots of elements that can be replicated elsewhere. And I was looking at the, the Ottawa um, writing about which conservative M MP won by small small margins, because ideally you would target an MP that won by a thousand or two thousand votes. I didn't, I can't find any. I, I didn't look that closely. But what the best target in the Ottawa area would be? Um, John Baird is the best for obvious reasons, because he's the foreign minister, but he won his seat by a fairly uh, fairly sizable margin. So it would be difficult to uh, to uh, to you know unseat him because of that. But he does. John Baird, for instance, goes around bragging about how there's 10,000 Muslims in his writing, and it, as, as to explain his support for Israel, he talks about how there's 1,000 Jews in his writing and 10,000 Muslims, uh, and say it's obviously a principle, it's not an electoral thing, it's a principle thing, right? Um, so, they, and I, I think it's like, you know, primarily the, uh, some, the Somali community out there, um, which you know, the question of Palestine might not be that high on the list, but it might be on the list, uh, it, might, it might be some, an issue that is worth bringing up um, in the lead up to the election. 
uh, as well as actually their policy on on Somalia. Actually, there's some interesting stuff there that might be worth um, um, embarrassing uh, John Baird about uh, with a campaign, a negative campaign. So I think that running a negative campaign where we, we choose six or seven writings across the country um, might uh, be something that that uh, that we want to do as part of. Uh, uh, getting information out about foreign policy issues, but also about having an impact electorally. But more generally, uh, <clears throat> we've got to force the issue onto the elect, uh, onto the, onto the um, official elect election or electoral arena, uh, because too often the opposition parties just go along with the foreign policy establishment, and that uh, specifically in the case of the NDP, their principles only come out if there's lots of activism in it. If there's not lots of activism in the issue, they just go along with it. And we have to uh, put pressure to have them take, take the issue on, uh, take these different issues on, and hopefully to take them on with a little bit of, uh, with a little bit of force. And uh, uh, some people who have heard this talk have told me they consider it depressing. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anyone in this room that considers it depressing, but the reality is you take a long-term view of Canadian foreign policy as is, is rotten and terrible as Harper's foreign policy is, and it is certainly rotten to the core, uh, if you take the long-term view, there's reasons to be optimistic about Canadian foreign policy. And if you look at the bombing of Libya or the war in Afghanistan, both of which I think are contrary to the interests of most people in those countries and bad for the world more generally, those wars are or look very nice uh, compared to what Canada did in Korea 60 years ago. Right? 60 years ago, 27,000 Canadian troops were involved in a war in Korea that left between 3 and 4 million people dead, where the Americans stopped bombing North Korea because they, they found that all buildings more than two stories had already been destroyed. The level of violence and barbarity that Canada was involved with in Korea is infinitely worse than what's happened in, in, in Libya and Afghanistan more recently. And it's not because the military has suddenly become more humane and, and, and whatever. I mean, there's obviously some technological changes. But mostly, it's that the popular movements, the anti-war struggles, the anti-Vietnam War struggles, the Central American Solidarity Movements, the South African Apartheid, uh, the anti-Iraq War kind of movements, have civilized the military. And the military's capacity to get away with that level of violence has been significantly constrained. And so to me, that's the spirit in which we need to keep uh, uh, moving towards. I think the Canadian public today is less racist, more internationalist than ever before, more aware of what's going on in the world, more access to international news. And it's in that spirit that we need to keep struggling of the, uh, towards the um, uh, building on the concept, the idea that, that we're a collective humanity, and uh, to have a more justice-oriented came foreign policy. So hopefully uh, sometime, uh, not too far in the future, uh, someone who so happens to be born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, uh, gets uh, similar uh, opportunities as someone like myself who so happens to be born on the east side of Vancouver. Great, so I don't really know uh, how many questions there are, but um, or comments or, or criticisms. criticisms. <laughs> uh, hang on. Yeah, right. um, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering your own opinions on the considering the deplorable uh, future we've had with the uh, Harper, how has, like, were you surprised that he ended up with the majority? And uh, why do you think that's the case? Is it just he has an amazing public relations firm, or, or is it apathy among the public, or is this just not being informed? Um, well, first, the thing I'm just going to say, so just to, on a different note, I, so I have my books on the back table. Anyone's interested in books, especially if they're leaving early or whatever, I sell them on a sliding scale so that I have the official, the full price and then the, the, the lesser price, and you can, if you're interested, pay as much between those prices as you want. Uh, well, I think, the, I mean, obviously, about 60% of the public voted. 
uh, he got about, I think it was 39 and a half percent the Conservatives got. So when you break that down, that's, uh, what is that, 25 percent uh, of, uh, of Canadian public voted for the, for the Conservatives? I think the main reason for why Harper ha has won is because <coughs> most Canadians, or lots of Canadians, when you look around the world, uh, compared to the places that Canadians tend to look towards, compare themselves to, should I say, <coughs> econ economically things look pretty good. Right? You look to the U.S. and this crazy housing housing crisis, uh, you banking crisis. You look to Europe and you hear stories about Greece and Spain and incredible unemployment. And and relative to that, things are pretty good in Canada. And that's mainly because. Uh, Natural resource prices are, are, are high, and Canada has fairly natural resources. Other things with that, but so I think that's the main explanation. Uh, obviously, Harper is, I think, a very skilled uh, um, politician. I think that um, one of the things with uh, I, did, I should have said in the talk that I didn't say about foreign policy is that I think that for, for him, foreign policy is really playing to the base playing to the, the most right-wing sectors of the Conservative Party, the, the evangelical Christian Zionists, the, the right-wing uh, Jewish organizations, the Islamophobes, the military types, the, the mining and oil executives. And it's, <clears throat> it's playing to the base in the context of not doing everything the base wants on lots of domestic issues. The most obvious example of that would be on abortion. Right, the Conservatives, you know, the base of the Conservative Party, a significant element of it, wants abortion to be illegal. Right? He's not going to do that for electoral reasons. So how do you, how do you, 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 you try to please them, I think the Israel issue becomes one of those, and the sort of Islamophobic and the kind of militaristic whatever um, is, is part of that, is, is you please them on things where there's not going to be uh, much opposition to it. And foreign policy is something where the the opposition party is basically generally just leave it in the hands of the governing party. And so, so he, uh, he uses the, the foreign policy issues as, as a way to kind of like solidify the base, uh, even though not fully satisfying them on a lot of different issues. And um, so I think it, you know, it's clearly calculated. Also, there's questions of you know, vote splitting and vote division between the different parties, and that stuff I think contributes to it all. Um, and and you know, most importantly, the kind of macro level is the fact that big business, he's, big business is pleased, and big business tends to own the media, um, not just tends to, he basically does own the media, both either directly in the sense of ownership with the advertising and, and, and the media creation. Um, so that you know, is obviously a, a slant there. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think when it kind of like you know, outside of the whole systemic issues, um, which are ultimately the most important, but but outside of those systemic issues, at the end of it, the main reason comes down to just the fact that economically things look sort of relatively okay in Canada versus U.S. or Europe. Um, I just wanted to add to what you said about the Conservatives and the Um, and he was talking about how uh, the, the Canadian government is um, attacking consti the constitutional rights of First Nations groups in Canada and their treaty rights. And I would suggest that we stand with First Nations groups who are, are you know, fighting this and this, uh, they really need our support. And that also, you know, is relevant to how Canadians see ourselves as a country, how we uh, treat First Nations groups. For sure. I mean, I think there's you know, a couple of campaigns on sort of that are like that that have had some traction where mm -hmm. you know uh, non-Indigenous people have been sort of in solidarity. The question of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Mm -hmm. That campaign has been pretty successful in getting on. And <coughs> the Conservatives, of course, cut the budget of. Um, of uh, And, uh, and likewise, the campaign against Enbridge Pipeline in BC specifically, I mean, there's relatives outside of BC, but 
that there, you know, that's obviously with the First Nations that are at the forefront of um, pushing back against that with widespread, you know, sort of non um, indigenous kind of uh, involvement in the community. Well, I just uh, one clarification on that. I think it's with uh, Sisters in Spirit was the organization that the yeah. funding was cut, yeah. and they were actually not even allowed to use their name. Now they use families and sisters in spirit. Well, sisters in spirit, it was part of NMAC. Oh, the project of NMAC. Yeah. And then because the funding got cut off, uh, now families and sisters in spirit kind of came out. I don't know the whole like politics behind it, but they were actually angry that they weren't really told by NMAC, so they kind of started their own thing. So that's that's what happened. Yeah, which is which is you know I think. And wax. <coughs> they're, 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 the, the the issue there is that so much of their funding is controlled by the federal government. Yeah. So so they were. Yeah, it's all and they it. wouldn't allow them to use. They actually wanted to call themselves Sisters in Spirit, but I guess NWAC has the property ownership. <laughs> like they're the ones who came up with it. Like I don't know. There's a lot of politics in, yeah. in like and considering NGOs are pretty much arminous government yeah. in Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, like, the, the whole building solidarity with the First Nations, Haiti, Inuit um, organizations, and so on. I find the topic of mining really interesting um, because it'd just be really interesting to see the take on it for uh, Inuit communities, mm -hmm. right, uh, on this whole mining issue because it does. There doesn't seem to be as much um, kind of going against it because it's bringing economy into their communities. Like you, there's, there's no farming or anything up there, right? So it'd just be really interesting to see, I don't know, like make comparison there. Oh, I think there's more, there's more opposition than. than there's a certain, I mean, I, you know, I don't from know. From the Inuit community yeah, themselves? For, for yeah, from different communities about, mm. uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, particularly I think the whole process is where there's a lot of opposition because there's a lot of, love. But from what <coughs> I've, I've heard and, and read and, and is that, that the whole, pro like the EIS, like the whole process of getting the project started, like there's not a lot of, um, what do you call it, that? Yeah, exactly, right? And I mean, it's all written in like this gibberish English that nobody really understands. Uh, but in terms of the benefit, like the, the job creation aspect of this seems to be welcome. Um, but I guess a question that I had was, what's this Cloud Leaf project that you were mentioning about um, like the NGO Siga, NGO, and mining company? Um, these are projects to, to you mentioned to pacify the community. What would be an example? I, I have no idea. Oh, like what they're actually. Like uh, what is their project? Uh, I can't remember the details about that, but mm -hmm. like it, one, the one in, um, I think it's in Burkina Faso. It's like a job training, uh, uh, and and you have like I got a quote quote for the, the mining book. company like uh, to work in the mining. Well, company. that's exactly yeah. yeah. So 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 it's. CETA presents it like just job trainings, like whatever. And then the, in the book, I quote uh, a, the Burkina Faso uh, foreign minister, uh, or the government, whatever the minister saying, um, something to the effect of, um, it's important to, uh, to, tr to give train people because otherwise they'll start to making bigger demands on the mining company, or some, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, you know, we're doing this job training as a way to, you know, almost pretty explicit to pacifying. Um, but uh, that's the one. I they're 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 all they're all different. They're all like a specific thing in the in the local community, uh, which which on their on their own sounds wonderful. You yeah. know, like but then when, you but when, when it's yeah. part of process of you know, when you think of interesting about it, not so much that there are those programs, um, but that it is like subsidized in corporate social responsibility. You know, like we could expect those companies to put those programs in.
Yeah, but I, I would go more. I would go more at the political. I'm sure that's it's a clearly a subsidy for that. But I go more at the political level. What is this doing? What is this telling the whole NGO milieu? Right. It's trying. It's basically. It's it's weakening because there are, you know there are a few NGOs. I'm not a huge fan of CETA funded NGOs. This is a pretty broad rule because it was in the 80s. But but there are a few CETA funded NGOs that do say good things and even run some campaigns that sort of challenge the mining companies. And and this is basically part of a process of just further marginalizing those those NGOs and 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 you know strengthening those groups, those NGOs willing to be just unequivocally, I'm willing to work with Barrett Gold in the community where Barrett Gold is being challenged in Peru. And I mean that's pretty like that's and that's not just NGO like, you know, you could criticize uh, Plan Canada or World Vision for being kind of apolitical in the sense that they don't know, so they're just charity and they're trying to help you know, feed the, the African poor or whatever, right? There's really important criticism to made that. But now you're going one step further where you're really like, you're working with that company in the world. I mean, that's a, that's a level of politicization that, so I think that the, the, the subsidy element is something and these are very profitable, you know? I think they did a, some analysis of the three, three first companies that got uh, that were you know, in this kind of these projects with CETA and NGOs, and their total profits in the previous quarter were like four billion dollars. So they, these are they don't need seven million bucks in Canadian government money; they have more than enough you know, profits. Um, but but I, to me, the bigger criticism is is actually uh, what a bigger concern is actually what what this is doing, what this is what message is sending to the whole NGO world, and and that sort of kind of element, so. It also sort of undermines <coughs> the potential criticism of those organizations. They could be poisoning the water, but yet how can you, you know, attack them? Like, because typically an NGO will be fighting against that because they're in there to try and address some of the issues that the, the organization is actually creating in the first place. But then because they're in there and they're working with that NGO, then it makes it more difficult for the NGO to, to, to criticize them, makes it more difficult for anybody to criticize them because they're, first of all, associated with Plan Canada or one of these NGOs, and potentially they are giving some, there are some benefits to the community, so. Oh, and, and I, think it's, I think it's definitely, like where this is coming from is that the mining world feels a certain level of heat, uh, which they claim NGO world is putting, they claim they're getting unfairly criticized by the NGO world. That's their, you know, if you read the Canadian Mining Journal and all that kind of stuff, that's the, or the Northern Mine or whatever, that's, that's the kind of language. And so part of this, point of this, is exactly that, is to bring, and it's not going, you know, they, they'll claim that it's, you know, bringing the mining companies closer to the NGOs, but it's, you know, who's got the power in this relationship? Right? So. I really, I mean, well, the f uh, my general inclination is not no. I mean, that's you know, I, I don't know much of the legal system, so that, you know. So, um, but uh, uh, there would be some places, and certainly the the, the what's going on in, in Hud Bay, I think, is the company that's being taken to the, um, to, the, to, the to the courts, like the Canadian mm. mining company. But but I don't know the, the, all the leg the legalities of these or the legalese of this, but. But one of the reasons why mining companies are based in Canada is because you can't generally take, for what they do, they, if they do something bad abroad, you can't take them to Canadian courts. 
so this is this is a this is a like a, a, a path breaking um, attempt. I don't know how it all fits with the and there's actually legislation that I think it's Peter Julian, the NDP MP, has put forward. I think it died and trying to bring it back. It's a private members bill to bring in legislation like they have in the U.S. and I believe it's like a hundred countries around the world have legislation where you can hold a company accountable for what you did abroad in local court. Uh, um, so that's actually something that I think should be pursued and really need to, need to get. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you know where you know one of the things on like the uh, there's been um, on the Jewish National Fund of Canada, which is the Jewish National Fund is a racist institution in so many different ways, and and uh, and one of the things that's been discussed there is, is bringing a court case against this Jewish National Fund, which has a charitable status in this country, and uh, being contrary to the, uh, the, the the charter. And uh, you know, I don't know all the, the sort of legalese of that, but that's one of the things that's been suggested by a number of lawyers as part of the campaign of independent Jewish voices is, is waging against this Jewish National Fund's charitable status in this country would be to include, you know, the, the big part of it is a, is, a, is, a, is a court element to it. But my general inclination is that the court cases, if the court case is also part of a bigger political campaign, then for sure, then I think it makes a lot of sense. If it's a court case that's sort of isolated, unless you're absolutely sure about the, the legality of things, uh, my inclination would not to go that direction and rather go in a more campaign kind of route and make the court case part of that or pamphlet line that. I don't know. Um, so over the summer, um, I heard talks about Canada joining uh, talks about, um, about the TPP. Um, and I was just wondering if you knew what Canada's position on that uh, free trade agreement was. This is Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah. Uh, well, they just joined uh, last month. Officially, there was official. Um, yeah, they joined the TPP, and the TPP is is uh, I'm not sure exactly how many countries, but it's like eight, ten countries, most. Most few, few in Asia, I believe, New Zealand and Australia, U.S., Canada, Mexico, is, um, and uh, I don't know a whole lot of it about it to be honest with you. And uh, you know, it's it's another like the like NAFTA, like WTO, like the European Accord that's being that's the finalized it's basically how do you increase the power of investors and corporations is really what it is uh, in the case of the TPP one of the elements is is about um, Washington's plan I think to to contain China it's sort of somewhat directed against China in terms of geopolitically speaking um, and I know that you know, there's all kinds of things like increasing patent protections and all these kind of things that are very good for um, you know, multi major multinationals, um, but I don't I don't know you know sort of a whole lot more than that. I was wondering if you could comment. No, on there's a guy who's been asked this question. Yeah, my question goes back to Syria and the extracted uh, industry. Uh, there seems to be a lot of governance issue on, on part of host countries. So, what are your thoughts on Syria funding projects that are on bilateral basis between Syria and the host country involved? Uh, for example, uh, the Genesis project in Tanzania, which is uh, through the support of uh, CICI initiative, uh, uh, to make uh, the payment from the mining companies to the government and the payment from the government to mining companies more transparent. And also, <coughs> he was also fun uh, funding the idea, which is in the governmental forum on uh, mining, minerals, uh, with three M's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, it's a, it's a governmental forum on uh, it's an international forum bringing all developing nations together. Uh, I mean, the ministries uh, that are, uh, or the organizations that are active in the extracted sector, of the women that all together to promote uh, more openness, transparency. And, uh, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with the details of the Tanzania 
uh, thing, but you know, in, 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 in general, I think I'll obviously support uh, transparency in, in, uh, in mining payment and all that kind of stuff. So if that's what the, 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 um, the project with the Tanzanian government's about, I think that's a, you know, that's a, that's a good idea. Uh, I, the, the latter organization, uh, I'm not sure about it, but I, I think uh, uh, there's a, um, like a lot of the a lot of the CETA funding for mining related stuff. Like in Peru, there's a project uh, we're working with the Ministry of Mines or whatever it's called in Peru, which which uh, the language it's used is very you know how can you oppose it? It seems to be about like kind of um, modernizing mining mining kind of. Uh, um, legislation and that sort of stuff, but oftentimes it's it's much more politicized than that, and it's much more about actually advancing the interests of Canadian mining companies, or advancing the interests of international mining companies, which is almost entirely, you know, Canada's 60% of the world's mining companies are located in the Kane Sock Um So so you have to kind of know that what they tell us, you know, that even the name of the organization can sound great, and then you got to kind of you got to look a little deeper. But uh, but certainly, I think that you know, well, CETA is not just a, it's not just one thing. There's there's CETA does certainly many projects that CETA do. If you take them on their own, are good things and have you know, real po have positive impacts in you know people's lives in the in the short and potentially even medium and longer term. But um, the organization more generally. Is part of advancing Canadian foreign policy interests, and it's that those are clearly uh, uh, primarily advancing Western geopolitical interests and Western you know, Canadian corporate interests. So, yeah. <coughs> so just a follow up one. Uh, the project that you listed on your second chapter in your book, CETA uh, and Planet Canada, and also CETA and Mine, are they ongoing projects? No, no, they're ongoing. They just, they just started. They just started. Uh, uh, I think they were announced within the last year. They were announced. They've been announced within the last year, and and are. I'm not sure even if they have actually started yet, but they're in the process of starting, or just started. And and what the announcement that Fantino, Fantino, Fantino the new minister there, made on Friday, was that basically. We like this, these. Are, these first three were, you know, sort of a test case, or there's something that we're going to expand this whole model of things. So, so expect more and more um, similar type. Yeah. Okay. Do we have another two questions before we start? Okay. I was wondering if uh, you could comment on uh, the most recent assault on Gaza and uh, how it fits into the Canadian foreign policy. Well, obviously. Baird, uh, foreign minister, uh, you know, said uh, Israel is doing great humanitarian work while they, you know, dropping bombs on people. Um, so they completely endorsed it. Uh, with no, like no, uh, no hesitancy. Uh, and uh, you know, so it's just another example of the of the pro pro Israel policy, uh, which. Canada is part of the Gaza counter arms smuggling initiative, um, uh, but they don't seem to be able to stop the you know, big big weapons from getting into Gaza, which would be Israeli F-16s and uh, you know, whatever, right? But uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I mean it's it's whatever 162 I think the big Palestinians were killed. You know, mostly I don't know exact numbers breakdown, but mostly uh, civilian. High proportion, children, old people, you know, that sort of thing. Um, uh, what this is going to mean, I mean, there's all kinds of discussion and speculation about you know, can Hamas win and all that kind of stuff, which uh, I think is just ultimately going to be good for Hamas. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know what the, you know, clearly the, the, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank is, is further. Um, weakened by, by the perception, at least, or it seems like the perception that, that, that Hamas is able to um, 
just the ability to keep firing rockets, which are not particularly impressive uh, devices, um, uh, into Israel, just be able to continue doing that. Is that that's sort of like a sign of success, you know, because the the the, 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 the the military, the overwhelming Israeli military power, and the fact that it, they were able to fire some rockets that got towards Tel Aviv and, and forced um, people in Tel Aviv to not just act like it's another day, but that they actually, you know, their their lives were somewhat impacted. Um, that's also a uh, you know, sort of a, I guess, a sign of success for Hamas. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of destruction and, and, and horror for, for people living in Gaza. But, you know, at the end of the day, th these are sort of the calculations that do transpire, in, you know, in these contexts. And, and, um, and you know, you, you prefer that, that um, all this could be, you know, the Palestinians could get their, their rights by a, you know, nonviolent methods. Um, but, like that, you, the, the, the ability to just uh, scare um, Israelis does, you know, there is some some value in that, um, as sort of inhumane as that that uh, that can be. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, not, not a whole lot more than that. Uh, yeah. So, what is your take on um, Canada being sued because of the actions that uh, President Nahuatl mm -hmm. has taken? Um, have you heard about that? Oh, about the uh, about the uh, under under NAFTA for the uh, exactly mor moratorium on shale gas. Yeah. Yes. Uh, obviously, that's totally appalling. That you know. Uh, so I think people saw the story. I think that it's a uh, it's a private uh, an American company, company yeah. that um, under the Chapter Eleven of NAFTA is suing um, Canada for two hundred and fifty million bucks yeah. because Mahua. Well, it's actually no. It's not even because of Mahua. It's because of the previous. Charay had brought in this. Charay had had suspended uh, operations, but Mahua has now entrenched. So it, it was more of a short-term thing that Charay had done because there was really serious backlash to the shale gas. Okay. And so one of the companies that's involved in the shale gas in, in, in Quebec had launched a lawsuit under NAFTA for um, uh, impacting their profits or whatever the, the, the language is that's used. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I mean it's it's that's uh, the the there was a WTO decision too, just about the, the Green Energy Act in, in Ontario, about uh, about you know, uh, moving away from coal and, and towards uh, more more wind and and, uh, and there's a WTO decision saying that that's a, that's a um, illegal according to WTO to subsidizing local industry and all this kind of stuff. It's, it, it's been, you know, I think there's lots of criticism of the Green Energy Act, but it's been a, this, it's been sort of, pos this is the, you know, the positive element is being, um, being uh, uh, threatened by uh, you know, these corporate globalization sort of institutions that, uh, that are really about transnational investors at the expense of the environment. And, and uh, yeah, so that's a, uh, that's a disturbing one, and it's a reason why we should pull out of NAFTA. Yeah, I thought we could pull out of NAFTA. We have to give like six months notice, right? Mm -hmm. So. But even the NDP is now, not even. Now they're basically going along with NAFTA after, you know, part of their. Well, I met um, an NDP MP recently. One of those uh, twenty-some-year-olds that got into Parliament uh, the last election and. Uh, she was um, defending the, the conservatives, and um, it was about um, it was about the tar sands that we were meeting with her. And the uh, first thing she said was, "We're not going to close the tar sands tomorrow." Which uh, you know, my thought in my head was like, uh, "You stupid blank," because uh, that's not what we're here about. You know, like we don't expect you to shut it tomorrow. But and then she started defending the conservatives. And their stance on the tar sands. So I don't think the NDP is really a, a viable opposition. No, I mean they're they're making it clear that they're uh, they want to do as little to to make the business class um, like them. feel threatened oh. as possible.
Yeah, they, and they, they come along. The, the, you know, I mean, like what happened with with uh, Quebec student movement and the success there is, there was not, you know, student movement. The thrust of student movement had no opinion about uh, which party to vote for or any of that kind of stuff. But they were able to push the PQ to take a position against the tuition increase, and they basically and they pushed the PQ to the left. And, you know, in the first two weeks, the PQ did a whole series of things, positive uh, um, changes left-wing changes, and unfortunately, since then, there's been a real big pushback from the business community, and they, the, and the, the PQ has you know, gone back closer to their more sort of traditional pro-corporate kind, of, uh, kind of policy of the past couple of decades, but, but there, there, you know, there was clear success on the student issue, successes on other issues, and, um, and so to me, the mo main focus that we need to do is, 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 is we need to change the political culture or climate, where Idea is no longer seen, you know, seen reasonable, and uh, and even just like you know, the, with the with the conservatives on on um, on Enbridge pipeline in BC, I mean, they came out the start of this year, they were saying that anyone who opposes this stuff is a, is a radical terrorist. Yeah. They were yeah. saying that they were going, yeah. you know, yeah. and now why aren't they saying that anymore? Well, they're not saying that anymore because there's been this like gr this groundswell of popular activism in BC, predominantly, on the issue, uh, to the point where. They don't want to be, I mean, they're still trying to advance the pipeline, but they don't want to be so obviously connected to it because that means they're going to lose eight seats in the province or whatever. And so um, they've you know, backed away from that kind of language. So, so that to me is the, the you know, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an anarchist, in a, so I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm sympathetic towards socialist libertarian uh, ideals. I do think in the here and now, governments can have significant impacts on people's lives, and, and you know, I much prefer a Thomas Mulcair government in there than a than a Charest, than a, than a Harper government. But that's not main main. It, most of what we need to do is focus on uh, building uh, power outside of the electoral arena. You know, in my opinion, and focusing. Can you talk about the nails and the There's a, a time called the on the budget implementation or the implementation of the ginormous omnibus bill of the budget. Um, and I believe it's at 7 or 7.30. I don't have the details written down. But I have it. I believe. Oh, you do? Yes. Great. Thank you. What do you I need to call my student up. <laughs> yeah, I think it's organized by the Canadian Labour Council. Okay. Um, <coughs> So it's called em Emergency Town Hall, Omnibudget Bills and Your Environmental Laws. It's at the Centertown United Church, 507 Bank Street, and um, it's saying 7.30, but a previous email I received said 7. Cool. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Justice.